Welcome to the University of Georgia's celebration of 50 years of computing. What began in 1957 with a punch card calculator and a staff of two is now a vast information network supporting the strategic directions and priorities of the university, including building the new learning environment, maximizing research opportunities, and competing in a global economy. Join us now as we walk through five decades and relive highlights of the past 50 years. Started up with Linda Colbert. Uh, we had there was two two employees and, and two professional employees, which was me and Carmen, and then there was a lady named Joan Fuddle, who was a secretary. And I think her office was in the men's room <laughs> <laughs> because the urinals were still left in the building. We went next to the Lumpkin House. That's the rock house built by Governor Lumpkin. I don't know how many years it was. It was at least three years before we got a real computer. And that one was the IBM 650, which was the first real computer in anywhere in the world. Well, it wasn't the first real computer in the world, but the only successful commercial one. But it was, we thought we were in high cotton. <laughs> we then got them. The, the, we went from Bain and on and got a 79, IBM 794, which was the cream, 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 cream of, of, of computers. It was about the only commercial one available. Dr. Common, to tell you how, how he, he was pretty good, all we had was a basement to put this big monster in. <laughs> and it didn't take it long to figure out, let's, let's reconsider this, maybe we can... And we hung some of the controllers from the ceiling. James L. Carmen was a man who was fascinated by large computers. Uh, uh, in some ways, he viewed as successful in terms of deploying uh, computer resources, uh, having the most powerful and largest machines of his peers. When he acquired that machine effectively with no financial support from the university, and I'm sure at a cost of millions of dollars. He was convinced that he could pay for it by selling time to industry and agencies in the Southeast. And because it was one of the first such machines outside of uh, NASA facilities. Uh, he did succeed in spades, uh, selling time to Lockheed Marietta, for example. Carmen was a entrepreneur, and they would come over here and they would literally rent the computer center and throw everybody out. They brought their own operators, they brought their own tapes, and you know, the, the thing was expensive. Okay, it was expensive machines. So yeah. When you rent that thing to them all weekend, I don't know how much money we got, but somebody in the university would know not that it matters anymore. But they got in trouble with the IRS. <laughs> okay, because the IRS says, uh, you know, this is not a, this is a commercial venture now. Uh -huh. You got to pay income tax. And so then, uh, my understanding was the negotiation was okay. If we quit, can we just call it even? <laughs> okay. Can we make a deal? Uh -huh. yeah. And so that was in the that was in the Lockheed coming over here. But uh, it, it, it had many vacuum tubes. Um, we had to put a hood over it to take the heat out. It was. Uh, Tell me that you could heat a five-room house with the heat that came off the vacuum tube hmm. from everything. It was, in the meantime, the failure was about 30 minutes because with all those vacuum tubes, but I'm going to be blowing up, blowing up filament pretty, pretty soon. Vacuum tubes were always uh, burning out or giving low output that uh, would cause various types of problems. 
that required uh, service engineers to be on site at all times. There was never uh, a day go by that, that you didn't have to replace some part to, uh, uh, to keep the system operational. At that time we had what was called the Hollerith card. The Hollerith card had uh, 12 rows. It was an uh, 80 column card and we had equipment that punched holes in it and, and the, the cards would then uh, be read uh, by mechanical means so that uh, the data could be inputted into uh, the uh, system. Ferrite is a, is, a, is a powdered iron material where they, they take iron powder and mix it with uh, a, a resin and form little, little donuts with it. Mm -hmm. And the donuts, in the case of ferrite core, are about the size of the head of a pen. The 7094 had 36-bit memory with four parity bits, I believe, which made a total of 40 of these planes, these, these, these grids. Each one had 4,096 donuts in it. So a 36-word memory array, which is what we had in our 7094, was uh, about six inches square and about two and a half feet long. Well, later on, the next step, I think, was building the um, computer center in South Branch Library. It was the basement of the South Branch Library. And um, it was, it had gone to a big organization then, you know, there were lots of programs, lots of analysts, lots of key patients. Back in those days, there were probably eight people per shift. We had four shifts working um, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Even holidays, we never shut down. Uh, we spent a lot of time mounting round reel tapes in, in 77 when I started and back probably late 80s we got a robot which took up half of one side of, a, a, of the room to house this one machine that had square tapes as we called it. When I started computing in the early 70s and uh, established some collaborations with people in Europe, I would often uh, fly over to Germany for two weekends and the week in between just to get some cycles on the computers there because we did not have enough power. And the Cyber 205 gave us the computing power that we needed to really be at the forefront. I don't know if you recall who was president in the early 80s, but it was Ronald Reagan. And, 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 by God, we were going to spend the Russians out of uh, dominance. So there was lots of money going to Department of Defense and other federal agencies. Uh, they, they took the position that if we didn't do something dramatic in terms of investing in supercomputing in this nation, we were going to become third world. Uh, it, it certainly motivated Dr. Carmen to think about acquiring a Cyber 205. And I was there uh, uh, in a sales discussion that occurred at the back in the back of a pickup at Rock Eagle. <laughs> the question then was how do we pay for it? Well, fortuitously, and by this time Dr. Carmen had become the special assistant to the president for computing at Fred's ear. And and there was $10 million sitting out there in the state monies. They knew that they had to come up with some strategy whereby they could defensively accept and expend $10 million. And the Cyber 205 became that investment opportunity. And I don't know if you remember the headlines in the local paper. They, 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 they were three inches tall about announcing the acquisition of Cyber 205 and how Athens was going to become, I don't know, minimally the Raleigh of Georgia, if, if not the MIT of the Southeast. Because at the time that we had the Cyber 205, 
we were within a factor of two or three of having the fastest university computer in the country and certainly within a factor of ten of the very fastest computers that were being built and largely used in, in major government laboratories. The maintenance on that machine, including the software licenses, you know they only had about a dozen of them installed, was a neighborhood of several million dollars a year. And, that, and we had to come up with that. When, when Gorbachev opened up the Soviet Union, which eventually then resulted in the downfall, the breaking apart of the country and the removal of a lot of the threat. Um, the U.S. government decreased their purchase of large supercomputers for defense work, for intelligence work. It's not to say they stopped buying completely, but they decreased fairly dramatically. And a number of the companies lost 30% or more of their customer base. It just went out of business. Uh, we easily spent, including the state monies, 12 to 13 million dollars on supercomputing facilities. When I was ultimately able to dispose of the Cyber 205. You recall what it brought? <laughs> I know it wasn't much. We got $200 for it and had to pay the man to haul it away. They, they were salvaging it for copper. So by that time, Dr. Carmen had passed away. And I can still remember as we were looking for what machines we might replace the 205 with, uh, Walter McRae saying one of the important considerations should be the feeling that the company will still be around in five years. And I think with but one exception, all of the companies that had offered us these wonderful new machines were out of business. I'm not a great wizard, but I didn't see I didn't see personal computing coming out of it at all. I thought they would be good to simulate a key punch, but <laughs> I didn't see them being very much useful at all as far as doing it, solving the real problem. One of Dr. Carmen's worries that he expressed early on was that we would get too wrapped up in the micros. Well, fortunately for us, we did get wrapped up in the micros, and here is one on my desk today uh, that's, of course, far faster than what we had with the uh, special purpose computers then. Of course, the big event of 1977 was the uh, rollout of the Apple II, the uh, TRS-80 Model 1 and the Commodore PET all in one year. In 1981, IBM rolled out the personal computer and I was at one of the first unveilings of that in the Yale Computer Center. And my reaction was the same as a lot of other people's reaction. Finally, a micro that isn't too small or too toy-like for us. Uh, it had a metal body. Uh, the screen was 80 characters wide, not 40. You didn't have big game-like letters, uh, and you had a really interesting basic interpreter. Each machine that came to the university system came to me. If you bought an IBM PC, which was the only thing really available um, at that time for uh, higher education, Apple hadn't quite caught on at that time. You had to order the system through me, it had to come to me, and we had to configure the system, take it to the end user, and train them on how to use it. And we saw a new system from Xerox that came in. It was demoed here. And the big fact, the big interesting thing about this thing was it had this new thing called a mouse. And it had this new thing called a graphical user interface. And Xerox was demoing it, but they didn't quite know what to do with it. And of course, you know, the story was that eventually Steve Jobs saw it and copied it and, you know, we had Macintosh uh, come out of that. And uh, a lot of times when we first started those classes, you'd say, okay, well, let's talk about how the mouse works. And you're kind of, everybody's kind of going along, but there's this one person back in the back that's waving the mouse in the air and, or they're trying to use it as a remote control, like a clicker, <laughs> or you hear somebody make a noise in the back and what they've done is they Hello, computer. Two events. 
events uh, of the telecommunications industry in the early 18, 1980s. Uh, divestiture means that AT&T was broken up into multiple independent companies and deregulation meant that these independent companies then could offer telecommunication services so long as they were, I guess, cheaper without you know, always seeking the approval of public utility commissions. Well, I and other people on the campus, including particularly Bob Bugby, uh, saw an opportunity to, to uh, increase available monies for investment in technology infrastructure if we would have to be patient. But if, if we were to purchase our own telephone switch after the basic switch had been paid for, there would be those monies that we could then invest in networking infrastructure. Networking was becoming uh, uh, a major need on the campus. This was the early 80s. We, we think of networking as starting in the 80s, and that's generally true when you think about campus networking, but a lot of people don't realize that the University of Georgia was part of the University System of Georgia computer network, which began in 1970. And the purpose of that network was to provide computing resources to all the schools throughout the university system. And the University of Georgia was the central site location for that hardware that provided those services. In the early 80s, we connected to something at that time called BitNet. It was the Because It's Time network. And it was a store and forward network based upon IBM's remote job entry protocols. What this meant was that each computer in the network connected to one or more other computers forming a chain. And when a message had to go from one computer to another, it had to pass through every single computer in between where the message was stored and then forwarded on when the space became available on the outgoing message queue. This basically resulted in very slow communications at the same time, the internet was non-existent. There was something called the ARPANET, which was the Advanced Research Projects Network of the U.S. Department of Defense. It was a grid network where computers connected to a background grid and was designed specifically to be able to survive the loss of one or more network nodes. This was really because they were trying to design a network which could survive a nuclear attack. We joined BitNet first, and our first connection was to the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. Doug Matthews and I drove over to Chattanooga in a university van carrying a 9.6 megabit bisynchronous modem, which was about the size of a small television set. So we could connect to Chattanooga. This was the basic rule. Each person had to find a site to connect to and pay for the line between their site and the site they connected to, including providing the equipment. Later, Georgia Tech would connect to us, and we would become a, way, a, a, a waypoint between the BitNet and Georgia Tech. Then later on, other state, sites within the state connected to Tech, and so the network grew. So networking has become something that started many years ago, connecting institutions, and connecting departments to something that connected people. It really started with BitNet. All of a sudden we were able to send emails to people all over the world. And then the internet shows up and changed everything. We were doing so much more than sending email. We were now able, whenever we wanted, to gather and collect and read about things happening all over the world in an instant. Rodney Simone invited me to come into a room to see a weather picture, uh, a picture of weather that was moving across, um, across uh, Illinois, as I recall. I thought, wow, that's cool, but 
so what? I mean, I've seen video recordings that are on the internet before. That, that was interesting, but it didn't really seem earth shattering until Bert told me that it was live, that we were seeing it as it was actually taking place. And for me, that was crazy. How could we see something via the internet now, even as it took place? Now, now that seems like, well, of course it happens, but back in 1994, that was unusual, weird, and uh, I like to refer to that moment in that dark room with uh, Bert as what I call a TCE moment, a this changes everything moment. That now we really started to think about ways that you could distribute internationally information in a range of different media instantaneously. And for somebody like myself who works in telecommunications, work in radio, TV, film, uh, this was a brand new way that you could push out what was incredibly expensive to do via broadcast media. As a manager, I was accountable for a lot of mainframe applications, um, and among those at that time was email. And we've, we've come a long way since that time, but it was not nearly as ubiquitous as it is today. We have evolved from the old text-based screens into obviously a more graphical and even video-based arena now. Um, some of you may be aware of the Arches email system that is the predecessor to the current UGA mail. Uh, that was our, really our first uh, campus-wide email solution and it was a client-server technology, uh, could incorporate the ability to use graphical interfaces, the point-and-click, if you will, uh, which is, I think, where much of the uh, computing technology was going at the time. You made a comment to me once, Bob, I think in an email that the GIDC, you made an interesting parallel between it and Google. Who oh, is? But <laughs> an interesting comparison. In GIDC was a specialist information system for the scientific user and recovered materials from at the peak it had to be six signals every month for 4,000 people we searched the new incoming article. We also searched retrospectively if you wanted to find out what had been done on the subject, we built your profile and over two weeks it went to all six million. Back in 1997, that was, that was also the beginning of a unique partnership that EITS, which was called UCNS at the time, established with what is now the Center for Teaching and Learning. Back during that time period, it was called the Office of Instructional Support and Development. It was a unique partnership in that we collaboratively provided support for WebCT. As a young manager with what was then UCNS, uh, now EITS, one of the first things that I was asked to do was to put a committee together and to evaluate alternatives for learning management systems. Greg and Carolyn felt that the faculty should choose the system uh, that was implemented on campus. We were involved in advertising the, uh, this courseware that was available and we were encouraging faculty to try and use it so that when the vote came, the faculty could say, we chose this system. And WebCT, as I'm sure many of you are aware, uh, was selected in this in this arena was the late 90s. It was exponential in terms of the growth on campus. Um, there was tremendous uh, acceptance, I think, among the faculty and students. In 2000, we even had the, the International WebCT Conference here on campus in July. And there were some people from Scandinavia, <coughs> excuse me, who felt it was a bit warm. proud to have been the first and have put in place the requisite planning to meaningfully establish the position, but uh, that, I mean, that, that, that establishment is still going on. I mean, it, it, it takes a long while. And the CIO, at some level, is responsible for these competing resources. Uh, you know, you have to assign priorities. Uh, 
You have to work with people to establish priorities. And as a CIO, you know, there, there aren't easy answers to, to how you, you allocate your resources. You have finite resources, but how you allocate those resources to different and sometimes competing interests on campus, whether you're talking about the research environment, the academic environment, the different parts of the administrative environment. The role of a, of a chief information officer is anything near what it was a decade ago or five years ago. People aren't looking for the technical, they're looking for strategic vision, collaboration, communication, the ability to tell the story and convince people of what's going to happen and why we need to go a certain way to be competitive or, or to meet a certain goal. Not about any one technology. That's very different from a decade ago for the CIO. I think IT has come faster than the culture has been able to accept the change. So we're trying to catch up. We're trying to help people understand the importance that we're so dependent on the technology that you can't let it lag while at the same time playing catch up in meeting the service requirements and expectations. So all of this said, it comes right back to managing expectations. The campus, the uh, user community, the administration, all of us. It may well be that grid computing is the computing format of the future and will always remain so. In 50 years, I think the campus, the idea of a campus, is going to just fade out and much more be like I am a part of this group of ideas that I access through my computer. Technology is becoming everything everywhere. Uh, there was a, a famous Japanese quote that says, vision without action is simply a daydream, action without vision is a nightmare, but when you put them together you can change the world. And I think that's what technology is all about.